Hi, it's Phoebe from The Horror Show with Brian Keene. Do you like goth, cosplay, fun pinup clothes, cute retro stuff? Have I got the place for you. Subculture Corsets is an awesome store in Jacksonville, Florida, right off of I-95 in the Avenues Mall. You need to go check it out. They've even got a corset that would look good on Brian Keene. I promise you they'll help you find everything you need. If you can't make it into the store, guess what? You can order online at subculturecorsets.com. And if you enter the horror show with Brian Keene, you'll get a 10% discount. Or just mention that at the store when you're checking out. You'll get a discount there too. Have a great day and see you at the store. No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over. No comment! The f Brian Keene was also unavailable for comment. And welcome back to The Horror Show, brought to you by the Project Entertainment Network. I am your host, Brian Keene. With me today in studio, not one, but two co-hosts and one very special guest. First of all, to my immediate right, Mr. Excitement himself, Mr. Dave Thomas. Good evening. And to my farther right, Miss Excitement herself, Phoebe. Yay! Hello, hello. And uh, congratulations to both of you. Good job for carrying the show last week uh, while, oh, I was thank at, you. while I was at Firefest for Kids. Oh, my. Uh, we'll talk about we're, that. We're, I was going to say, we're going to hear about yeah, that later. It sounds about like that a moment, but, uh, I personally can't wait to hear this story. <laughs> but uh, I, I also want to let folks know also sitting here with us, uh, he is, of course, no stranger. To longtime listeners, he's appeared on episodes 13, 39, 98, and our live uh, episode mm -hmm. 100 telethon. His books include Hunter of the Dead, The Ghoul Archipelago, Billy and the Clonosaurus, and the recently released horror science fiction novel, The Hematophages. I am, of course, talking about Mr. Stephen Kozadowski. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Did I say that right, hematophages? Uh, sure. Because I, I, I never had any college, so right, you know, right. I, I'm never sure about these things. I, uh, I was telling you off the air. I read this book in two days, um, and I took to social media immediately. This is this is the best thing I've read so far this year. Uh, followed closely behind by uh, the Forgotten Girl by Rio Ewers. Okay. Um. Which, speaking of which, this week's show is brought to you by The Forgotten Girl by Rio Ewers, his new riveting thriller. Harvey Anderson is a 26-year-old street performer from New Jersey. He enjoys his peaceful life, but everything turns upside down when he is abducted and beaten by a group of thugs working for a sinister man known as The Spider. These goons have spent nine years searching for Harvey's girlfriend, Sally. Now they think they know where she lives and whom she loves. There's only one problem, Phoebe. What? What? Sally is gone, and Harvey has no memory of her, which makes no sense to him until the spider explains that Sally has the ability to erase a person's memories, an ability she has used to delete herself from Harvey's mind. But emotion runs deeper than memory, and Harvey realizes he still feels something for this forgotten girl. Political corruption and manipulation, a serial killer's dark secrets, an appetite for absolute terrible power for harvey anderson finding the forgotten girl comes at quite a cost that's the forgotten girl by rio yours y-o-u-e-r-s available right now wherever books are sold in hardcover and of course in ebook as well this week's show is also brought to you by sean seaback's a looking in view uh we've been telling you about this book for months and we're going to tell you about it again um if you haven't read it you need to sit down and do so this is also high up there in my list 
for this year. I, I haven't yet started compiling a top 10 list. I know that as of right now, Kazanuski, you've, you've got number one. Thank you. Well now, done. you know, there's some people could come along and dethrone you yet. You know, they, they, we're only in July, but sure. But cage yes. match. I say cage, cage match. match. Yeah. As long as it's not Wrath James White, I think oh. I could take him in a cage match. <laughs> I don't know. Christian really? Jensen would put up a pretty good fight. Oh, no, no. Christian's a sweetheart. He, Christ- uh, he is, but I think he could, he could distract, hurt he could distract somebody. Christian with, with bourbon. Yeah, just he's, he's my true. sweetheart. That's so. true. That's true. <laughs> take a look inside a world of the fantastic, strange, and macabre with. A looking in view by Sean Seaback, which is comprised of 13 eerie, mysterious tales. A looking in view is his first collection. It features a bonus novella, Blue Collar Diesel. It's available right now at Amazon for Kindle, Kindle Unlimited, and in paperback. Once again, that's Sean Seaback, S-E-A-N-S-E-E-B-A-C-H. So thanks to Rio and Sean both for sponsoring this week's show. So yes, I wasn't here last week because... I was at Firefest for kids. You, you guys are all familiar with Firefest. No, right? enlighten me. Is it like Burning Man? <laughs> it's like Burning Man gone terribly awry. Okay. Firefest was this huge scandal a few months ago where uh, this <gasps> this fucking frat boy, twenty five year old okay. frat boy, and uh, a rapper. Yeah, yeah. Who yeah. I can't remember. I, w- I want to say Ja Rule. I think, I think. it was Ja Rule. And, and apparently, Ja Rule had no idea this was going to happen. Right. It was all frat boy. But they they conned, like, the spawn of the 1%, like, every rich kid in the world into going to this this island in the Bahamas for this supposed music fest called Firefest. And it was supposed to be, like, high-luxury tickets. You know, some people paid, like, $12,000 for a ticket. And when they got there, there's no festival. There's no lodging. There's no food. It's like Lord of the fucking flies. Okay. Um, yeah, it was. I remember now. Yeah, what you're he, talking he's about. now been indicted. Well, I I was I was at Firefest for children ages six to ten. Oh God. Also known as Cub Scout Camp. Oh no. Um, nope. 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 Yeah. I originally I told Dave we're just going to talk about Cub Scout Camp and then interview Kazanuski. Uh huh. And I I decided I I can't do that because I have a lot of respect for uh wait a minute something's the the fun sway is wrong with this table there's your water there's your water whose water is this that's dave's Dave's. that's dave's water here's your water dave (laughs) don't want to script the feng shui all right now now i now i can do a show okay now everything's just right yeah a lot of i i have nothing but love and respect for the people my pack right you know the other parents. I don't want to offend any of them, right? Nor do I want to offend the the members of the Boy Scouts of, Amer- of America who who were giving it a real effort. Mm-hmm. Okay. So instead of spending the entire show complaining about me and Dungeon Master's week at Scout Camp, I'm I'm just going to offer two examples. It was a whole week. It, it the thing runs for a whole week. Oh my. Um. Okay. I, I'm just going to offer two examples that that will kind of explain to you the kind of week we had actually three because i want to i want to talk about the tents too tents are provided they tell us so we get there now steven yeah. you were in the army yeah you were awarded a bronze star if i remember correctly correct okay so you've been out in the field sure describe the 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 typical tent when you were out in the desert out in the field uh you know about uh well uh, i suppose listeners can't see but about the size of this garage so maybe uh you know 20 feet by 20 feet, something like that. You get, you can walk in, so maybe six, seven feet tall. Uh, you know, got a floor, pretty... I mean, it's not the most comfortable thing in the world, but, you know, you can stay in there pretty right. comfortable. Right. Now, now you know, you're our, our troops. You're protecting this country. You deserve luxury. I don't know that you would have called that luxury. However, compared <laughs> to the tents provided by... By the Boy Scouts of America, mm-hmm. you were staying at the Todd's motherfucking hall. Oh wow! Um, yeah, five by five, five green, by five, green canvas, whose original color wasn't green. Okay, what? so it was spray painted. I believe so. Um, to cover up the black mold that was growing. <gasps> oh. Um, Dungeon Master said, "What's that smell?" And I said, "That's the tent." And he said, "Something died in this tent." So Ooh. so that was our sleeping course. But okay, two examples. Okay. First example, do you guys know what Gaga Ball is? 
No. I did not know what Gaga oh, Ball was either. Oh, is this the thing either. where they bounce it off of a trampoline? And they and go, they... Gaga Ball. And then they start hitting it. Basically, it's dodgeball. Okay. Oh. But you can only aim from the knees down. Oh. So it's okay. like Duck, Duck, Goose meets dodgeball. Duck, Duck, Goose meets dodgeball. Okay. Right. So they have a, an actual Gaga Ball arena. It's supposed to be much safer than dodgeball. And... Again, keeping in mind this camp is for ages 6 to about 10 or 11. Okay. If you stay in those parameters, it would be much safer than dodgeball. Uh, The problem is the adults who decide that they have to play as well. So you you picture this. Against the little kids? you You got 20 little kids all wanting to play dodgeball, all learning about fellowship and brotherhood and making friends and you know kids from different packs all over the state and dungeon master he was so good he's telling people hello my name used his real name but for the yeah, points sure. oh i'm dungeon master i have my own podcast <laughs> you know um and it's going great and then this big eared dopey looking motherfucker who's from another pack decides he's going to play gaga ball with these children and and gets in now. Keep in mind, it's dodgeball from the knees down. You you, you the kids can only it's like str- bowling dodgeball. Yeah, underhanded. Yeah. This this six foot tall dopey motherfucker is is kicking the ball, hitting kids in the head, hitting them in the face, hitting them in the stomach, going yeah, ooh, ah, you know. I beat a six year old. Wins like three games in a row, and the people in charge of the Gaga ball pit. Because here's the thing. Most of the volunteer staff, and they they are, I'm assuming, volunteer staff, right. are scouts themselves. Um, okay. And, uh, and they're teenagers. Um, teenagers are surly by nature. Okay? Teenage boys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're a hot mess. So, you know, they're, they, they don't, they're not doing shit that this guy's in there. Me and the other parents are watching this this fucking tool, but nobody wants to say anything because, you know, duty and honor and scout code and, and all that. Well, you know, I didn't sign up for that. So <laughs> about, the, about the fourth time, you know, all the kids get out and, and big ears is one again. And I pull all the children aside and I say, I'm Dungeon Master's dad. And I say our pack number. And I say, uh, what you guys should do is everybody make a truce and take him out first. That's and uh, the volunteers are like everything over there, everything okay over there, Mister Keen? Yeah, yeah, just giving the kids a pep talk. They'll be oh, right in. Oh my god! So the kids go back in, and they took down the grown up first. And in fact, it was his own son that took him out. And then his own son was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah," and wouldn't stop. <laughs> which leads me to believe maybe there was something going on in that family. I, I don't know. Well, I would think if he's coming in and, and trying to beat six year olds in dodgeball esque play i would say there's something going on yeah with him yeah that was awesome that's teamwork yeah, right exactly you the, taught them the... i taught those those young men a lesson in teamwork and strategy and strategy and to always 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 pummel the shit out of, out of fascist authority especially if they got big ears so okay the other thing that happened oh. um now long time listeners know i am a firearms enthusiast I'm not going to get into politics here. No. You, you folks that have listened to the show, you know that I am neither left nor right. You know I'm neither a Republican or a Democrat, a conservative or a progressive. I am something your simple minds cannot comprehend. You're Brian fucking Key. Okay? But I, I enjoy firearms. When used and owned responsibly. Of course. Okay, I own about 25 of them. I would be very happy. To be required to have a license for those firearms. I would be very happy if half the guns I owed, I own were no longer available to the public. Because there's no reason I need half those guns other than legally I can buy them. Okay? I'm a, my, my point is I'm a responsible gun owner, gun owner. So is Dungeon Master's mother. Okay? Since the day this child was born, even though our guns are locked up in safes, you guys have seen my gun safe. You need a key and a numerical combination to get into that fucking thing. But we've instilled in him, guns are dangerous. You do not touch them. If you see one, you back away from it. You leave the room. You come tell us. Makes sense. Okay. We've instilled that in him. Mm -hmm. Because that's what a responsible gun owner and parent should do. Mm -hmm. 
Well, they had the BB gun range, and the scouts had to qualify on this. It wasn't it wasn't an elective thing. They had to do this. We didn't know about this till we get there. Well, Dungeon Master hears BB gun, and he's he's forty four shades of anxiety. Aww. Because now he's got to touch a gun. Now he's got to touch this thing that mommy and daddy have told him is dangerous. So I, I give him a talk, and I'm mm-hmm. like, you know, look. Yes, a, a BB gun is a weapon. Yes, you can hurt somebody with it. But we're going to be real careful, and I'm going to walk you through it. You know, and, and, you know, I had a BB gun when I was your age. He's still, he's very timid about this, mm-hmm. all right? Okay. So we get there. The range supervisor has his NRA marksman trainer hat on. And, and I'm not making fun of that. Coop, our our own co-host, he's a NRA trainer. Um, you know, I personally am not an NRA member. I can't stand the NRA's politics. I I, I loathe the fact that that every time <laughs> there's a mass shooting, the NRA uses it as a political statement. I I just I I find that reprehensible, no matter which side of the political aisle you're on. But I have no problems with NRA members themselves. Much of my family is an NRA member. So uh, we get up there to the range, and this guy is probably 70, and he's got his NRA hat on. And he was apparently under the impression that these ages 6 to 10-year-olds were shipping off to Afghanistan next week. He starts barking at them like the drill instructor from Full Metal Jacket. Well, this is really helping Dungeon Master's anxiety over having to touch the BB gun. Um then he gets them all up to the range, and he just assumes that every one of these children has has safely handled a firearm before. He goes over, you know, the basics, what Coop and I might tell Tim Levin the first time we take him to a range. But he, he doesn't go over the operation of the gun itself. You know, he goes over finger off the trigger, always point down range, you know, all, all yeah. the stuff, you know, Stephen. But no, this is how you cock it. This is the trigger. This is what I'm talking about. Don't touch this part. Doesn't go over any of that. So Dungeon Master gets up there. You know, don't have a fucking clue what he's supposed to do. And they're making the parents stand back, so I can't go help him. Well, finally, I'm like, fuck this. I go up to help my child. Well, then the, the, the range master has a problem with me. I heard him grumbling later on that night that I don't know anything about duty or honor or respect. So I, I may... This I may, <laughs> keeping in mind that he was 70 and this camp is very big, I, I may have absconded with the golf cart he'd been using all day and I may have hidden it in the woods. Or I may just be saying that for com- comedic effect, depending on who's listening right now. Oh, boy. But, uh, anyway, yeah. that that. But you know what? All in all, we had a really fun time. Um, I, I Again, I, I can't say enough that the people in my pack are awesome um especially our pack leaders i don't know if they want their names on the air so i'm not going to say it but a really really good group of folks really good group of kids and as i said a lot of the volunteers were were great but you know there were a a, a couple bad apples but they did not spoil the bunch but uh were that's... there were there a lot of kids there was it like a big oh yeah it's like probably two three hundred kids oh wow yeah. okay i mean it's a huge thing oh, but okay. uh it was a good time, but that's where I was, and that's where Dungeon Master was. And thanks to the two of you for uh, for carrying water for us last week. Hey, no problem. So you guys did good. It was very good. Was yeah. it? I ramble, and I we don't use notes. <laughs> but, well, I, I was going to say that normally we have uh, we had an agenda, but it's Phoebe, and about thirty seconds in, we were off the rails. Yep, so, pretty much. <laughs> um, yeah, that's just how it goes. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, a couple more uh, things of note here before we get to the news. Uh, I want to mention that Knights of the Living Dead, which is uh, a new anthology edited by our good friend Jonathan Mayberry of the Three Guys with Beards podcast, uh, which can be heard right here on the Project Entertainment Network, debuted at number one on Amazon this week. Wow. Number one with a bullet. Nicely that's, done. That's in the horror anthology category. Um, the book features stories by myself, hmm. Joe Lansdale, David Scow, a whole bunch of other people. Um, it is set in the world of George Romero's Night of the Living Dead. Um, in fact, Jonathan Mayberry was a guest on Coast to Coast AM this week and spent a lot of time talking about me on the show. Oh, 
know. So thank you for that, Jonathan. Um, Dave, I, I think a moratorium on three guys with beards jokes for four weeks. <laughs> well, that's not going to be hard because uh, they're on their what they call quote unquote summer break, which oh. I, I believe lasts for six months. Oh, so, so that's yeah. why he was. That's why he had time to be on yeah. coast to coast. Yeah, okay, exactly. well, all right. I, I got to tell you, though, I'm so happy for Jonathan. I'm very pleased with my story in this book. I, I'm happy that whatever little, some very small part I played helped make this successful. But once again, I'm reminded of, of how little use I have for Publishers Weekly and their staff. Yeah. Um, Phoebe, you you probably don't know this. Steven, you may not know this. Dave does. Um, Nor does you know, this reflect my opinion. <laughs> yes. Smart man. But, you know, uh, <laughs> Publishers Weekly has always treated me like like the mutant inbred cousin that you keep in the tool shed, you know, a mile from the house, and you keep him chained. Um, they never give me good publicity. The only time they ever actually gave me a lot of publicity was during the Dorchester Wars, and and then they had a very bad habit, regardless of the reporter, of misquoting me or... They'd go to Dorchester for a response, and Dorchester would say, oh, well, Keene's lying. And they'd come back to me, and I'd say, no, I'm not lying. Here are the printouts. Here's an attachment in your email. Proves we're telling the truth. And they, you know, they, would, they just wouldn't publish that. They'd, they'd leave that part out. But you know what? We won. Water under the bridge. But, uh, yeah, their, their review of Knights of the Living Dead. If there's one thing in this genre I'm known for, it's what? Zombies. Zombies. All right? This is a zombie anthology. My name is prominent on the cover. You know how it's usually Stephen King, Clive Barker, and many more, or and others? Uh-uh. None of that. Brian fucking Keen, number one on the cover. Number one in all the marketing materials. Number one in all the press releases, okay? And yet, Publishers Weekly ignores that. They don't, they don't mention me at all in the review. They, uh, they say it's, I, I'm not complaining. What I'm pointing out is that I, I find it funny, the lengths they go to. Okay. And, and to illustrate, here's what they say in the review. They write, quote, Romero himself and the film's co-creator, John Russo, both contribute as do authors directly inspired by them and those who have further solidified and expanded the genre, such as. Jonathan Mayberry, Mira Grant, Chuck Wendig, Carrie Ryan, and Neil and Brenda Shusterman, end quote. Well, that's pretty crappy. Those who have further solidified and expanded the genre, talking about zombies. Name on the cover. Name and all the press material. What did you do to them? I don't know. Well, uh, somebody not suggested nice. it to me that, that I don't live in New York, and I'm not an academic, and my politics are are not left to center enough for them. I, I don't know. Um, but I just, I found it amusing that after all these years, they still you know, want to be that way, but you know what? I'm number one on the fucking cover and the book is number one on Amazon. So fuck so, all y'all, <laughs> but, but please be nice to Steven Kazanowski. Yes, of course. <laughs> See what you have to look forward to <laughs> in your many years. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Making many enemies. Aww. I hope you don't make enemies. I, I hope I've taught you better than that. None that know about it. None that ah, oh. see, well played. You're using the Jeff Cooper school of. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're using the gentle art of making enemies. Yes. Okay. Oh, uh, something else that I want to touch on before we get to the news. Um, we've been hinting around on this show for what, Dave? The last six months that. There was something happening at DC Comics, and that it might involve a lot of your favorite horror authors. Well, uh, DC finally announced it this this past week. DC's House of Horror was announced. Um, it will be in comic stores on October 25th. It is an 80-page comic book. That's a big comic book. Um, featuring stories by myself, uh, our co-host Mary San Giovanni, Edward Lee, Brian Smith, Rath James White, Nick Cutter, Weston Oaks, and Ronald Malfi. Okay, um, these are stories using DC's characters, okay? So they're not just like random horror stories. These are stories about Green Lantern and Wonder Woman and Superman and the Justice League. 
you know, set in the DC universe, but they're horror stories. Um, are, are they alternate? Like, is Green Lantern going to die at the end? Or You know what? It's not that I'm limited on what I can say. It's that I don't want to say because I think that's going to ruin. Uh, I think it'll spoil it in some cases. So could they okay. do whatever they wanted in I mean, the storyline? You, you could see. Yes. We okay. had carte blanche to do whatever we wanted, which actually backfired because oh. in, in the case of Mary, Mary had Wonder Woman. Uh -huh. Okay. And she turned her script into Keith Giffen. And Keith calls me and he, he says, hey. Are you okay dating her? And I, I said, "What do you mean?" He goes, <laughs> "He goes, she scares me." <laughs> and I said, "What do you mean?" He goes, "Look, I've got Wrath and Brian Smith and Edward Lee in this thing. I figured they would be the ones that would give me trouble with the script, but but Mary's, she's trying to get me fired. I can't publish this in a DC comic book." <laughs> wow. It was it was hardcore. Um, so. They they really let us cut loose. And then Keith came in and said, you can't do this. You can't do that. Uh, Lee got Superman. I I'll tell you the basic premise of Lee's story. Okay. Okay. Farmhouse in Kansas. Mm -hmm. Spaceship from Krypton crashes. Now Martha Kent is basically fighting John Carpenter's The Thing. Oh. Okay. Um, you know, Lee had a... We had a couple of rewrites till we got it safe for general comic book audiences. Mary had a rewrite before we got it safe. Um, I'm not sure about Wrath. I think I think Wrath toned it down quite a bit. Okay. Um, but to answer your question, at first glance, these would probably all be Elseworld stories. However, um, at least in the case of mine, it, it's without spoiling it, it it's strongly hinted that this is in continuity and, and and that this is happening okay um so that that's really all i can say um but yeah that'll be out october 25th we'll be talking about it a lot on the show so should we get to the news dave or do you have anything to cover before we do that oh we we uh yeah uh, what do you have something to say uh yeah i have a news item okay we'll we'll, let, we'll do ours first and we'll do yours okay, okay. yeah right. yeah because i know what he has uh you know Phoebe has been off because she had surgery. Right. So we've been watching a lot of uh, television and, and, and movies. First of all, we went to the theater and saw the new Spider-Man. Awesome. Which is awesome. fab. It's fabulous. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, and that's not my thing. Yeah. No, it's it's the best, uh, easily the best Spider-Man movie ever. Easily. So uh, I would agree. Yeah. I would so yeah, you saw it too. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it was a very nice theater. It smelled good and we had cushy seats and food delivered to the table. <laughs> yes. Just saying, <laughs> compared to our other movie experience last week. So uh, that, so we saw that, uh, and then we watched uh, Doctor Strange on Netflix, which I was surprised how good that was. Oh, yeah. Because oh, I had yeah. no expectations that that was going to be any good. Oh, no, it's fantastic. No, it's, it's amazing. Cargill knocked it out of the park yeah. with that fucking Absolutely. script. Absolutely. I enjoyed it, and I had no concept of what it was supposed to be about. I didn't know why the dude was wearing a cape in the commercials. I thought, what an idiot. <laughs> but then I got it, and it was good. I enjoyed yeah. it. No. Well, she doesn't like That's she doesn't read comic books, right. so yeah. So we watch that. Then, then we watch some things that weren't necessarily good because uh, <sighs> Phoebe has this thing where she will turn on and scroll to the movie channels, and whatever movie is currently starting, she'll just start watching it. Uh, so she sometimes doesn't make good choices. Like we watched The Forest. Oh my god! <laughs> is it that the one that takes place in Japanese. Japan? Yes. The Suicide Forest. Yes. Mary really liked that. Oh my really? god! Yeah, oh, we hated yeah, it. Was awful. It's, I didn't so, watch it. It's, it's awful. It's boring it makes no sense it's just it's yeah. a mess yeah it's, it's a not mess. scary it's just no it's terrible and then <laughs> and i know you'll have a comment about this because i walk in the room yesterday she's watching the happening why i didn't know why would you do that to yourself <laughs> he walks in and i'm like oh look it's the happening he goes that movie sucks now look <laughs> m night i'm told you listen Oh, I, like I know you're only 40 minutes away from the studio and, you know, the invite stands anytime Absolutely. you want to come hang out. Yeah. And, you know, I love you. I even championed Lady in the Water. Uh, I, you know, when everyone else turned their backs on you after the village, I said, no, the village is goddamn brilliant. I like 25 years from now, people will, will go back and revisit the village and they'll say, you know what? I don't know what we were bitching about other than social media was new and we had a, a, a outlet to bitch. But. No, the, the happening is not happening. Everybody has that one dud in their 
it, I, I, <laughs> you know, I, oh. for me, it was entombed. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know. So, I, he he walks in. He goes, "This is a terrible movie." Yeah, because I I had watched oh, it previously, so bad many years ago on on HBO, and she was watching it. But then, after the happening is over, oh my god, Suicide Squad comes on. Can I just say, what the fuck was that? Now, I, I, was this movies to kill yourself by night? Apparently, at the, at the, at the Dave Thomas. Apparently, I, what I, we were we were going to go out to the farmers market, and I said, seriously. This movie is garbage. It made Batman versus Superman look like a classic. And it, I, it's yeah. it's all so she watched about ten minutes of it. This is she, she's like a train wreck and you can't look away. Like like it's it's just awful. I know yeah. listeners, I, I'm saying in advance, I know how terribly sexist this sounds. But uh there's a guy on YouTube, I don't know if the video is still up. He took he edited out everything but the scenes that Harley Quinn is in. And it was a better movie. And <laughs> I mean, if you watch it on mute and you just want to get <laughs> off on, you know, Aww. watching a beautiful, attractive actress dressed like Harlequin, that might be a more palatable version. I, I mean, I think I would years. prefer to watch that for Pete's sake. <laughs> well, the the key to that is it would be shorter. So, uh, you know, that would be the best thing. That was awful. Yeah, no, that movie's That uh, was. Yeah. Uh, this was my expression. Phoebe. What? Here's, here's what you need to do. Okay. Yeah. Twin Peaks. You need to start season Wait, one, episode on one list. tonight. That's on our list. Start it tonight. Okay. And and get caught up with the rest of us because I desperately, desperately want to talk about Twin Peaks on the air. Okay. I want to do a whole Twin Peaks episode. Cause, okay. Because I have I have thoughts. Okay. Are you watching Twin Peaks, Kazanuski? I am not. I didn't watch it when I was kind of young. Well, yeah, you were you were a little out. kid when that came out. Yeah. Have Have you? Do you have any desire to 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 go look at it and see what us old people are raving about. I do, but it's one of those things where it seems kind of intimidating because I'm like, oh, I'm going to go watch this show from 1991 and go get caught up on it. Is it something I can really just walk into and you'd be like, okay, you're fine. No, you need to start at the beginning. Yeah, you can't watch this this revival. You'll be completely lost. Okay. Um. Yeah, you need to you need to start with, but it's on. I think. Uh, Netflix. It's not. Is it still on Netflix? It really? was for a long time. Sure. Um. It's out there. It's available. I'll lend you the DVDs. Okay. So, yeah. It's, we'll we'll yeah. try. The the other movie we watched was um, Passengers, with um. Oh, that was better who, than the other one. I'm trying to remember if I've that's, seen that. Um, or not. the Deadpool dude. That's no, not Deadpool. Ryan Reynolds. It's not, no, it's not. It's it's uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy guy. Guardians of oh, the Galaxy. Chris Pratt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris Pratt and um, uh, what's her name? Conger Games Girl. Yeah, Hunger Jennifer Games. Lawrence. I, Jennifer oh, Lawrence, this yeah. is the one where they the go space to space. Yeah. And, yeah. Okay. I, I, I cried. <laughs> I kind of like that. I, I, I cried. thought that his character was it was a real dick move, and I lost yeah. all sympathy for him. That's really all we can say without giving spoilers, right? Yeah. Like it's it's um, it's okay. It's, yeah. it's like we watched it. And I'm like, all right, I don't want to set my TV on fire like you know some of the other stuff you've been watching, but <laughs> you know it wasn't that great. So, and I'm just gonna throw this out again because in case people didn't last week, go see Baby Driver. Oh, it's the please. movie of the year, yes. and you must see it. See, I keep hearing that. I just, I got... dude, I'm you telling it. Did you it's see amazing. it? I've got no desire to Look see it. it. It's so I loved good. it. This is a movie I would go see again. Yeah, yeah, yes, but yeah. in a clean, not smelly theater. <laughs> Where they bring dinner to your table? Yeah. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Yeah. Just, yeah. We're spoiled. Uh, well, it's, it's Edgar Wright. Yeah, I, mean, I know, but it's 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 amazing. really amazing. And yeah. take it from a girl who doesn't like this kind of thing. I loved it. Was it? A, is it about like a, a baby that drives no. a car? No, no baby. It's like no. Baby's Day Out. Okay. No, it's meets not. Meets the Fast and the Furious. But you think Dave would like a yeah. movie with a baby in the See, lead? You know, you know what I think it is? I, I can't stand Alec Baldwin. And it's it's not just because... But he's not in it. It's not just because he and I got in a fight on Twitter. I, I thought he was a repugnant motherfucker back, going back to his days on the Howard Stern show. Okay. Um, how... How that man has gotten away with the way he talked to his yeah. his partners and to his own daughter mm-hmm. and and to other people. I, but anyway, he had that movie come out about being a baby. Oh, and Dun- yeah. Dungeon baby. Master really wanted to go Boss see that. Baby was that Boss Baby? And I or something? had a crisis of conscience. Do I do I treat my son to this film he desperately wants to see, or do right. I stand by my Alec Baldwin boycott? And I, I guess I got that confused with Baby Driver. Yeah, no, no, no. No, it's not. not. It's not oh, this is not a children's same. movie. It's Could you, could you imagine me R. going to see a movie with, that involved a baby? Well, Unless you, the baby breathes fire and shoots lasers out of its eyes. You got Phoebe with you. I, I don't like babies either. You yeah. like Minions? 
I like Minions, but they're not babies. But that's a, it's a kid's movie. No, I like the Minions. I okay. Just, yeah. Uh, All right. Yeah, minions aren't funny. All right. Well, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe I will go oh, see Baby. No, it's there's, it's there's violence galore. Yeah. And it's, awesome driving. Okay. And you like classic music. Oh yes, the music alone, Brian. Because it's it's what era. All kinds. All all the sixties, seventies. It it's. A lot of the scenes are cut to specific songs. Yeah. It's ingenious. It's amazing. It's the best use of music I've seen since the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Wow. Yeah. Yes. It's j- just for that aspect alone, you should see it, but the movie's uh, amazing. Me. All right. Well, you know what? I got one I want to throw out there, too. Okay. okay. Um, I watched it in two days. Uh, the Defiant Ones. It's a documentary right now on HBO. It's about Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine. He was talking about that. And they're separate and yet very similar career arcs and how those eventually joined together to form Interscope and, uh, you know, of course, Beats by Dre. If it sounds odd, it's not. It's it's fascinating. It is one of the best documentaries I have ever seen. If you are a music fan, and, and I'm talking regardless of genre, um, the the rare... Never before seen footage of Tom Petty, Stevie Nicks, Bruce Springsteen, U2, NWA, uh, Wrecking Crew, Wu-Tang, you know, Eminem, Snoop. It's amazing. Also, you guys remember when Straight Outta Compton came out. I love the movie. I said my big problem with it was it ends before the whole Death Row Records saga, which could be its own movie, but I think is the most fascinating part of Dre's story. Um, this documentary, one and a half episodes are that movie. It's the, it's the death row saga. And it's just, it's fucking fascinating to watch. There's a scene with Suge Knight, like a real scene. Yeah, oh, it's a documentary. A, so it's yeah, real, people. real home archive footage of Suge Knight, Eddie Van Halen, Bono and Dr. Dre playing touch football together in Jimmy Iovine's backyard. Wow. I mean, how fucking surreal is that? I think this is on Dave's but, list to watch. Yeah, it's it's yeah, really it's, good. It's on HBO right now. Yeah, I, um, I found it very inspirational. I think um, it's four parts, right? Four parts. Yeah. Yep, an hour yeah, each, an four hour, hour long. Yeah, so yeah, and it's just it's it's phenomenal. It's one of the best documentaries I've yeah. ever seen. Speaking of HBO, Game of Thrones on Sunday. Yep, Ooh, yes. Yes. that's right. Finally, that's right. So I'm the very best excited. zombie show on television. That's right. Yes. <laughs> so, all right. That other zombie shows garbage. So, All right, let's go to the oh, news, Stephen. He's oh, got a new you've story. You've got news. Yes. I do. I do. Yes. And, I, <laughs> and d- don't worry, because I ran this by Dave uh, before we went on the air. Wait a minute. Wait. <laughs> You'll see why. He he does one show, and suddenly now it's the horror show with Dave Thomas. <laughs> well, yeah, You'll see why. You'll all see. Right. You'll see why. Okay, so first of all, I want to say thank you to the uh, Brian, Fe- Brian Keene Fan Club on Facebook, which if you're listening to this, you should go and join. And uh, specifically to Ron Davis, who's the founder of the Brian Keene Fan Club, and also re-listened to the episode two weeks ago that had this question in it. So two weeks ago, you guys posed the question, uh, who should play Brian in the biopic about his life? And I said, well, this sounds like a question for the Brian Keene Fan Club. Uh, so, <laughs> Oh, dear. <laughs> so I, I, I put this question up. So uh, coming in uh, last place here, I guess I misjudged the room, was uh, Sean Connery. Oh, see, I would have thought that would be number one. He's old. Uh, yeah, but you you don't you didn't hear about this, Phoebe. Last year, when I was in Los Angeles walking down the street, I legitimately got mistaken for Sean Connery. This big muscle bound dude came running up to me. I thought I was about to get my ass kicked. That's funny. And he's like, Mr. Connery, can I get a picture with you? And I thought he was being a smart ass. No, yeah. he completely thought I was Sean Connery. Oh, well, that's a compliment. I said, Well, of course you can. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Sean Connery. Okay, coming in uh, fourth place is a tie with one vote apiece. Michael Ironside. Michael Sarah. Fuck you, whoever <laughs> <Yeah>. voted that. <laughs> I think that might have been Sean Seaback. I- I'll have to double check. <laughs> uh, Brian Cranston. Mm. I could see that. I could see That's that. That's a Breaking Bad yeah. guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> I could see that. Uh, and Stephen Ogg, who plays uh, Simon on The Walking Dead. I don't. I don't I know that I know him. No idea what that yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, in third place, Tom Hardy. Ooh, oh, fuck yeah! He's pretty. I, I'm honored, but I, I don't know that. <laughs> I don't know that I look anything like Tom Hardy. He's but very I, pretty. Yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't pick that one either. Yeah. But, uh, that's I'll that's take cool. It. Yeah, yeah. Okay, in second place with four votes, including mine, a legend, 
Sir Patrick Stewart. Ooh. Fuck yeah, I'll take that. Yeah. Make yeah. it so. But <laughs> but the number one, the winner, and the person who should play Brian in the biopic of his life, dun, dun, dun. by a wide margin, seven votes, Mr. Kurt Russell. Oh, hell yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I think that's a given. He'd have to shave his head, though. Oh, he has that nice hair, though. He does have a nice head He's of got hair. really good hair. Where, where, where's Nicolas Cage in that list? <laughs> nobody nobody uh, I, proposed I, Nicolas oh, Cage, man. I guess. Oh, man. How's that not... Come I on. Don't, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Well, well thanks to them, yeah. and thanks yeah, to you for doing awesome. that. Yeah, that's awesome. So, I think I think the Brian Cranston's the best pick, seriously. I could see that. Yeah. yeah I could totally I could. see that. Yeah. I mean, uh, we should have Mary on the air for this discussion. I mean, Robert Downey Jr., given his portrayal of Tony Stark, he could get the swagger and the snark and the attitude down, the public persona, but he, he doesn't look anything no, like that. I, no, I think, you know, I honestly think if someone's going to do this, that Cranston would pull it off and be amazing. I well, really do. There we go. Yeah. Maybe in another 15 years, yeah. if HBO <laughs> wants to do a biopic about this is, this me is, and, yeah. and Xander Harris yeah. and our, our career arcs and how at the end of our lives we formed a, a headphone company. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> this is Lombardo's next movie. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> no, I know what Lombardo's next movie is. Speaking of which, folks, um, next week, not only are we going to have full coverage of Brian Smith's 68 kill, I'm also hoping to have Lombardo in studio, and we're going to talk to you about the finished product that is I'm Dreaming of a White Doomsday, Ooh. his first feature-length film, which I am, of course, the executive producer. Um, I'm excited. Plus, very, for very exciting things coming. It's Lombardo, so many actionable things will be said. Well, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> the authorities will be on alert. It'll be great. All right. Well, yes. Yeah, shout out to the Brian Keene fan group. Um, I don't post there because I want them to have the freedom. If if they think a book sucked, they should be allowed to say that without thinking I'm going to see it. Um, so I won't say if I lurk there or not. But but. Shout out to those folks. A lot of good folks there, I'm told. Oh, yeah. And oh, uh, yeah. they post some funny things sometimes, I'm told. Oh, yeah, fuck it. I lurk there sometimes, okay? <laughs> but I don't click like. I thought you were going to say, oh, but I have Kozanewski. Give me the best stuff. The best stuff? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, a lot of people in our social media asked if we were going to talk about this. This actually happened last week, Dave and Phoebe, uh, during your show, but you guys didn't touch on it. Um, which is okay, because you had Phoebe. Of course, you're going to get sidetracked. Um, but <laughs> a lot of people, both professionals in the field and fans of the genre, were incensed and offended and took to social media to express their outrage last week over a piece that Steve Rose wrote for The Guardian, in which he postulated that there is a new subgenre called post horror, uh -huh. evidenced by films like The Witch it comes at night, etc. Um, basically, his premise was these are films that are marketed as horror movies, but they don't have any of the familiar trappings of the horror genre. Now, everybody wanted to know where I'm going to weigh in on this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the debate because, honestly, I, I don't, I don't understand why people were so pissed off about this. this I, I read the article yeah. twice to see if, like, you, know, I don't know. He, posted something political but I, there's nothing there this is why we didn't comment last week because first of all she doesn't uh, yeah. know anything about this second of all i too have the same opinions you do i read this article I'm like why is everyone fussing over yeah, this i mean you know i i you want to know my opinion i agree with steve rose that post horror is a thing why is it so wrong to have another subgenre? We, we've got splatter punk we've got extreme horror we've got quiet horror we've got new weird new pulp we, we've got Lansdale and Laird Barron, who are genres unto themselves. Exactly. We can't have post-horror. Um, however, now, I would argue against his hypothesis that this is a new thing. In, in that regard, I think uh, Mr. Rose is wrong. Um, you know, post-horror, as he defines it, has been happening in both horror film and horror literature for decades, going all the way back to Splatterpunk. Probably before Splatterpunk, but Splatterpunk was the the you know the most concrete example that our listening audience is probably going to understand. Um, you know, you consider Skip Inspector's novel *The Cleanup*. Uh, it was marketed as horror. It was written by two of the most prominent horror authors of that day, but it didn't include any 
of the tropes of the genre. It was more like M. Night Shyamalan's Unbreakable Mm -hmm. than it was Friday the 13th or The Omen. Um, And not just Splatterpunk either. Authors like Charles Grant, Peter Straub, and T.M. Wright were doing post-horror in the 80s. More recently, we see it from authors like Josh Mallerman, Paul Tremblay, and Sarah Pinborough. And in film, the Blair Witch Project, often hailed as the originator of the found footage subgenre, was most certainly a prime example of so-called post-horror. So, Dave, you already offered your thoughts. Stephen, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I tend to agree that uh, what what he said is not all that uh, offensive or, or out of control. I think it's probably the idea... I think people are somehow taking away the idea that this means that horror is done and horror doesn't need to exist and uh, we've kind of bypassed horror and that sort of thing. I, I gather that's what people are offended about. And uh, I, I kind of agree with you that he's not saying that. He's kind of saying, here's something like, uh, here, like you said, a different subset of horror. Because it's not going away. Right. The Walking Dead's didn't get canceled. You know, the, Damn it. <laughs> I didn't stop There's publishing. There's still hope. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't stop publishing. You didn't stop publishing. I think it's the, uh, the suggestion that we don't need horror that people have taken away from this, is my guess. But I, I don't even get that he was doubling down on that suggestion. I, I mean, he postulated I, it. But, I didn't really get that yeah, from this either. I, you know, he suggested, is this what's happening? Right. But he didn't get on a soapbox and we we don't need horror, yeah, damn it. You know, just stop writing horror so, and write more you know, books about cheese or something. I don't, I don't know. know. It's just another Facebook let's freak out because, you know, I'm working on my zombie dog versus ninjas three book opus and now nobody will publish it. Which, right. You know, who cares? I mean, um, you know, I've heard S.J. Bagley Nick Mamatas, Jack yeah. Haringa debating this at, at conventions in the bar for, for years. 15 years now. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. this is nothing new. Yeah. That's a debate I stay out of because they're always smarter than me. And I just, <laughs> I just drink and talk about monster movies because I'm stupid. All right. Well, in other news, Emmy nominated sound editor and designer David Lewis Udall, a frequent collaborator of John Carpenter, passed away last week of pancreatic cancer. He mm. was 66 years old. Um, David's career as a sound editor and designer began in the late 70s, working alongside who, Dave? Every time we do one of these eulogies, it seems like this oh, is the director they got to start Corman. with. Roger Corman. Yeah, everybody starts. Yeah, with everybody him. got their start in the 70s yeah. working with Roger Corman. Um, David was the sound effects editor for 1978's Piranha. He went on to become a frequent collaborator with John Carpenter, uh, Escape from New York, The Thing, Christine, Halloween 2, Halloween 3. Um, He also worked on non-Carpenter horror films, uh, including April Fool's Day, A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, The Dream Warriors, Evil Dead 2. And think about the the sound in Evil Dead 2 and and what an important role it plays in that film. Um, Near Dark, Predator 2, Return of the Living Dead 3, many, many more. Um, Fellow sound man legend Steve Lee said in a quote to Deadline, The Thing is arguably his masterpiece. All those frightening creature sounds he created are just fantastic and just as scary today as they were when the film opened 35 years ago, almost to the week that he died. Mm -hmm. End quote. Um, And I would agree with that. The Thing, but like I said, Evil Dead 2, I I think the sound in that is often very underappreciated. Absolutely. Yeah, it's very underrated. I think it's an underrated movie in general. Just because everybody always talks about the first one, and they don't talk about the second, which I think is superior. I think the second one's far a far yeah, better, far film. better yeah. film. You know? Yeah, I I think so. And, and I so, never go back and watch the first one, but I I watch the second, second one in Army of Darkness yeah, all the time. Uh, yeah, you know? I agree. But uh, the thing, the sound in the thing, people have to understand. We have a lot of younger listeners that don't remember when that was in the, the movie theaters, and it was unlike anything any of us had ever oh, seen yeah. before. And the sound design work in that movie for the creatures is unbelievable. Oh, and yeah. It still totally holds up. Well, so. I mean, you're you're a little bit older than me, but you remember that summer. Our our choices for aliens were E.T. Mm-hmm. and The Thing. Yeah. And so you had this cute little cuddly thing that ate Reese's, Pre- Reese's Pieces. And, mm-hmm. you know, you see that one week and then you take your girlfriend the next week to see The Thing. Guess yeah. which one I was watching. You were, you were watching E.T.? I was. Yeah. <laughs> but so, yeah. Um, you know, David Lewis Udall, 66 yeah, years old. Rest shame. in peace. Yeah. Um, speaking of John Carpenter. Now, I had heard about this, but wasn't allowed to report on it. But now we can report on it because everybody else has reported on it. See, this is what happens when you go to Cub Scout camp for a week. Everybody (laughs) scoops you. (laughs) Um, John Carpenter has signed an overall deal 
with Universal Cable Productions, the owners of Brian Keene's Ghoul, as a matter of fact. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, under the New Deal, Carpenter will executive produce scripted programming with UCP for the NBC Universal Cable Entertainment Portfolio, as well as for external networks and streaming services, along with his longtime producing partner, Sandy King. That'll be done under their Storm King Productions banner. Um, already in development is Tales for a Halloween Night, which will be for the Sci-Fi Channel. That is based on Carpenter's award-winning graphic novel. Uh, additionally, he is also developing something called Nightside, which is based on the literary series by New York Times best-selling author Simon R. Green. I haven't read the Nightside series. Have any of you? No. No? No. I'm, I think it's Vampires. I think I so, know. but I'm not but positive. But kind of YA or something. Yeah, I think yeah. it's YA, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't, so. I'm not familiar with it. All right. Well, that's all the news I have. Anybody else have any news? Um, I, I should have waited. But, oh, no, no, no. Your your story was your story was good. Um, yeah, it's a slow. It's summer. It's a so slow it's, news week. It's slow it news really time is. Right now. That's good. I that mean, means something terrible is going on. I mean, there was you know there was some shit right before we hit record uh, involving Bizarro author M. P. Johnson. Um, I don't know but I don't want to report on it because we don't know anything about it. Yeah, I don't know the whole story. I don't want to violate her privacy. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I will say, you know, to the motherfuckers that were bullying her on Facebook, you know, step to me instead. I don't know, but uh, I, I don't I, know who was involved. I so. didn't see this. I um, never mind. <laughs> I don't want to get myself in trouble. Uh, I'll be quiet. Um, you should mention though. You got that, a juicy rumor? Uh, I'll I'll tell you off the air, and maybe we could report on it next week. Let's just say that. Ooh, we'd have to do some investigation. Ooh, yes, but I don't want to say anything right now. Can you say? Is it a publisher or a writer's it's, organization? It, it's or? a it's a writer. Oh, really? Yes. That's, okay. I, I'm not going to say anything else right All now. All right. Yes. Was uh, this a tip from a listener, or is this just something you observed? This is something I observed. You see Kazaniski yeah. Ham yeah. slowly getting him to talk about yeah. it on the air. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. I'm not going to I'm not gonna say it right now. So uh, right. That, we, we, should, do... we should mention next say, week. Scares and Cares. We will, yes, we will be at uh, the fourth or fifth annual Scares Fourth. You'd think I'd know this, being on yeah, uh, the board well, of directors all right. of the it's convention. Yeah, that's all right. It's a number. I get them confused. The fourth annual Scares That Care Charity Weekend in Williamsburg, Virginia. There are still hotel rooms, not at the main hotel, but at the hotel right across the parking lot. Um, there's you can you can still get in. Saturday, Dave, we're going to be doing a, a, a recording of the horror show, absolutely, with a big studio audience. Uh, that <laughs> that room holds about a hundred people, so okay. I hope we have. If you're going to scare the care, we ho- we hope you will join us Saturday yes. evening, eight o'clock, eight o'clock. Yes. Sit in the audience. Um, and, and not it's... sure who the guest is going to be. It is either going to be Rath James White, Joe Lansdale, or both of them. Okay, I'm not sure which yet, but it's also. You, me, Mary San Giovanni, right? Phoebe and right. Mike Lombardo, right? We're all going to be there. Everybody, all the all the co-hosts except for Coop and Dungeon Master, right? Yep. Will will be we'll on be, hand. We will be there to to amuse you, and you can ask us questions. And uh, we need to fill two hours, right? So uh, come prepared, and remember, Phoebe likes cocktails and doesn't want to pay for them, right? I, that's not you making me sound cheap. That's not true. <laughs> now you know, with such a big room. And a big panel. Is yeah. that little portable unit going to pick all of us up? It's, it uh, it will, yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. I mean, what else can we do? We, we could just, pack we up this, this studio and take it with us. Yeah. Right, Phoebe? See, that's, that's what I'm thinking. My that's going to be a pain in the butt. I'm Why? A, I'm a good roadie. Why? She's a good roadie. Okay. We'll talk about this off the air. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. I, I just, you know. That's a big room, and it's a, a square, and, and here's, sound is going to be everywhere. Here's the, here's the issue, since you want to get into this. Aww. First of all, we only have four microphones. Right. There's going to be at least five or six people. We've got four. We've got seven microphones. I've got those three Yeti they mics. They will not work with this. We, no? We went over that. Yeah, okay. it's a totally different system. We couldn't system. buy a little adapter at, at, no, no. at Radio Shack? Absolutely not. Is Radio Shack No, they're thing? not around anymore. No? Yeah, they're, they're gone. Maybe. Okay. No. No, that's not going to work. Well, um, uh, we'll talk about it later. Yeah, we can figure it out after. All right. Yeah. All right. I'm blameless, ladies and gentlemen. If if Raph sounds like James Moore, it wasn't me. I thought you said there was a four week moratorium. <laughs> oh shit! Plus that's about right. an hour. I just, I just violated it. <laughs> no, I just violated it. All right. Uh, whatever. Starting now. Okay. Starting now. Four week moratorium on making fun of three guys with beards. 
All right. You know who I'm not going to make fun of? Sean Seaback. Sean Seaback. Rio and yours. Rio yours. That's right. Sean Seaback's A Looking in View, which is available right now on Amazon for Kindle, Kindle Unlimited, and in paperback. Uh, stories such as Lillian, who witnesses the death of her undead mother. A story about a hitman who has one last favor to pay. Frustrated with his mother's boyfriend, 10-year-old Nathan runs away from home in an attempt for a better life. A nursing home has a strange visitor with more to offer than battered paperbacks for the residents. These stories and more, including a bonus novella, Blue Collar Diesel, all of that can be found in A Looking in View by Sean Seaback. And of course, Rio Yours' riveting thriller, The Forgotten Girl. It's getting praised by Sarah Pinborough. It's getting praised by Christopher Golden, by Joe Hill, by Brian Keene. I don't know what Brian Keene's praise does for a book, but hey, you know what? Some other very impressive people are, are praising it. Um, and that is available right now in hardcover and an ebook. And the hardcover, of course, is anywhere books are sold. So you can find that at the bookstore. So thanks to them for sponsoring this week's show. Now, speaking of books I enjoyed, Mr. Kazanowski, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Um, I am holding up. Your new book, The Hematophages, that is H-E-M-A-T-O-P-H-A-G-E-S for the other listeners who, like myself, never went to college. Um, Phoebe, now judging by the covers, is that a book you would read? Um, I can't see because it's kind of dark in here because uh, I don't know. Um, It's got an animal on the cover. Yeah, there's an animal. There's a yeah, giant. it's a lamprey eel. A lamprey eel. No, I don't like those. No? But it looks... They're really cute and cuddly in the book. I don't know. Um, maybe, but I, I think doesn't don't I'm, you write really scary stuff? I'm telling you, Mr. You, you, you need to read this book. Okay. Well, I'll take a recommendation. Do you, do you like Alien? Not really. That's not my thing. Do you like Event Horizon? Uh, I think I saw that movie once. Do you like my novel, The Rising? I've never read it. Dave. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You should read this book. I, I'm going to read it. Yeah. Um, no, I, 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 I plan on buying the book from him. It scares the cares. Well, I'm sure you will have copies for sale. Oh, yes. And yes. he will be uh, autographing them. Yes. So you have a week to start thinking about what you're going to write in my book because I want something impressive. Okay. So there you go. Well, I, you're, uh, you're in the acknowledgments. I, I, I understand that. I okay. have not seen that yet, obviously, but uh, I'm, well, I'm planning on buying books at, at scares. So. Well, you know, now speaking of which, a lot of people are going to scream nepotism. Yeah. This book is dedicated to me. Okay. okay, that doesn't mean shit. I, I've got fifty books dedicated to me. You know, at, at this point, um, two I mean, and a half years. I mean, into no, wait, the show. that came out wrong. Yeah. Of course, it means shit to me, Stephen, that right. you did it. But as far as if I'm going to get like it or not, if yeah. I right. if I'm going to like the book or not, you're going to like it or you're not. I'm not going to tell the names. truth. There have been some books dedicated to me that I will never read again. But hey, it was, it was nice that you thought of me. Um, but I told Stephen I I took a stack of books to scout camp with me. Uh, Rio yours is the forgotten girl, uh, the new thunderstorm books releases, um, and this, and I'm like, oh man, I, I, I gotta get to this. Cause you know, we're going to have them on the show soon. I'd like to talk about it. So I started it, blew through it in two days, Ooh, two days. Um, it is absolutely the best book I've read so far this year. Well, that's a wonderful, yeah. you know, now, like I said earlier, Hey, somebody may come along and, and, and knock you off. You know, Michael Marshall Smith or Brian Hodge or Lansdale or Melick, you know, one of them might release a new book this year. Sure. Um, but I got my eye on Paul Tremblay. Don't don't release anything. Or me. Paul Tremblay, <laughs> you know. I think you're um, safe. I don't think he has a book coming out till next year. So. Or Jans, your arch nemesis, oh, Jonathan Jans, Jans, who we're going to get, who, who I don't think we've ever talked about their rivalry on no, the show. We have not. So we're going to get into that Ooh. later. Um, but I, I, listen, you're a good friend. Okay, you, you started out. A fan. I, I met you at a signing. You, you, yes. JF Gonzalez and I were signing. We've talked about that on the air. People yes. can go back to your old episodes and listen. And I saw a spark in you, and I, I read your novel, Brain Eater Jones. And I said, all right, this kid's got chops. He can write. Um, and you've become a friend. In fact, you're one of the, the few people invited to my 50th birthday soiree that Mary is, is throwing, as, as I understand. Yes, yes, that's right. You get to hang out with my old Navy buddies and a, a bunch of old middle-aged writers, so that's going to be really exciting for you, I, I imagine. Sure. Um, More the Navy buddies than the writers, yeah, but sure. Okay. Um, but, man, I, I got to tell you from the bottom of my heart, you, you can do this for a living. This this book is, the, 
this is everything. And and this is not a slight against Sinister Grin, okay? You know, I'm happy and delighted that Sinister Grin published this, and I hope it's going to do really well for them. This could have been a mass market novel. Oh. Um, I think. You know, I, I, I think Tor or somebody, Apex, you know, um, hey, Sinister Grin got it, and good for them, you know. Um, but yeah, the, yeah, wow, dude. Um, so listening audience, basically the novel, I, I'm, this discussion is going to be without spoilers. I'm not going to spoil the book for anybody. Okay? okay. Because it deserves not to be spoiled. There's a lot of twists. Um, but it's basically this team of spacefarers. They go to a supposedly deserted planet to salvage a long lost mythical spaceship. Okay, what they encounter instead is pure terror. And now I described it online and to Phoebe a little bit ago as alien meets event horizon meets the rising. And there's elements of all three. There's sure. the derelict ship and, you know, the alien parasite. Um, there's the haunted derelict ship. Yes. Event horizon. And then there's the the element of controlling people's dead corpses yes. from the rising. So I guess my first question for you is consciously did those three things actually influence this or was that more of a subconscious thing for you alien alien and aliens absolutely that was definitely in the back of my mind um i, I really like the way you described it but uh one of the ways that i've been describing up till now was with office space um uh, which um a lot of it is uh jokes about bureaucracy oh, yeah. and that kind of thing uh, the the I don't think this is a spoiler. The 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 prologue and the epilogue are a, a career interview. Yes. You know, an HR interview. Yes. And it's just brilliantly biting, sarcastically funny. Yes. Um, uh, that's exactly. I, I've done so many interviews at this point, and uh, I know what you're supposed to say and why you're like when they say, what's your, what's your weakness? And you're supposed to say a secret strength. And it's basically like that. And, um, but uh, I... I w- yeah, I was definitely aiming for aliens. I had not thought about Event Horizon, um, but yeah, now that you mention it, definitely the rising, especially with the kind of uh, the hatred that the hematophages feel towards the humanity. Um, there, it's it's definitely um, a- of a piece with that. Well, I got I got to tell you now, you know, we've had we're what Dave a hundred and thirty shows in. This is one hundred twenty four. Okay, and I mean we've had. Young author after young author come in here and tell not just us, but the listening audience that I was an influence on them. To the best of my memory, this is the first time reading a novel by someone of your generation where I was like, holy shit, holy shit, that that's 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 my inspiration right there. Yeah, you're right. The hatred that they have for humanity, you know, and the fact that they're controlling these these corpses. I was like, holy shit. I inspired this. I, I it was it was a neat little fanboy moment for me. Absolutely. So, so I you know you said aliens, alien and aliens too was definitely on your mind. Did you worry about comparisons? Did you worry people because oh he's just ripping off Alien? No, because I did. I didn't think that it was that kind of. I mean, it was that kind of uh, space horror story. But I thought that the aliens were different enough. Um, that it would be uh, that there would be a comparison, but not a oh, he's just ripping it off. Because there's no like, there's no scenes where it's like oh, there's something hunting us down and this kind of. Th- it's very much about the uh, the existential horror of it and that kind of thing. And uh, what it was initially was it was kind of my take on on space vampires, right? And uh, this was actually well, you you read and you mentioned earlier Hunter of the Dead, right? And when I was workshopping Hunter of the Dead, one of the ideas I came up with was the hematophages. And I said, oh, what if it, well, I don't want to spoil it, but what I was like, what if it's a lamprey eel? And that's that's the origin of the vampire myth on humanity. But I realized I couldn't really do that and have the um, the characters where they're like, oh, I've been alive since however long and I've done this. They would just be these hateful, spiteful aliens. Right. So I realized it had to be for a different kind of novel, and this was what it was. Well, I, uh, I'm i glad with how it turned out. I want to talk about the world building of the novel. Um, you know, as we said, it's set in space. It's set in the far future. Uh, in fact, Dave, they look 
the characters in the book look at our era, the information age, the way we look at like the Middle Ages. Oh, wow. um, you know, concepts of things like statehood and nations are, are these quaint, antiquated ideas to them, you know, almost to the point of they don't really know what a state is or a nation. Um, you know, the world building in this was fantastic, but what impressed me about it is so much of science fiction, especially today's modern science fiction, they just they overwhelm the reader sure. with minute details and world building. It, 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 I mean, you know, George R. R. Martin, obviously that's not science fiction, but you know, 17 goddamn pages to describe the meal, the meal. that they're having at yep. the banquet. Um you don't do that. You reveal it very naturally. It's all part of the story's background. Um, you know, the color of their skin, the technology they use, uh, their system of government. Was that tricky to do? Did you end up cutting out pages of exposition and world building? To Because, I mean, it's tight. It's tight prose. You're right. I did cut out parts where I thought it was a little bit too on the nose. And I don't know if we're going to get into this in a minute, but the, the, are you, do you have a question about the gender? Yes, we are going to. We're going okay. to go there. Um, well, then I won't get too specific into that. But yeah, there were definitely times where I would write th something and I would be like, if there's two characters, it's just like you and me, like you said, like we would never discuss why aren't we paying tribute to our count? Like it just it, it, <laughs> like we would probably be aware that. There was a time when you were a peasant and you had a count, but it wouldn't necessarily be like, oh, how strange that we do that no longer. So, I, yeah, there were times when I had conversations where they were discussing explicit things. And I said, no, I need to cut this out and just hint at it around the margins. Like you said, like there were times when um, maybe the worst was with the space pirate attack where I think. Uh, one of the characters just, oh, I've never heard of these pirates. What do, what do they act like? That that might have been the worst where I was kind of like, as you know, Dave, but uh, a, a lot. Yes, there was a lot of stuff that hit the cutting room floor where I had uh, hit it too much on the news. I, I think you did a good job because, I mean, you know, like I said, it's a page turner. I mean, this book goes fast. Um, so, yeah, you you did just the right amount. How many drafts did you go through? Uh, on this one. I just did two drafts. Two, two yeah. drafts, really? Yeah, I'm impressed because it was uh, it was on uh, um, deadline for Sinister yeah. Grin. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the gender thing. You brought that up. It's an all female cast. Yes. There is not. Oh, look at that! Got Phoebe's attention. I'm intrigued. Phoebe, there's not a penis to be found in this book. Every character is female. Um, males are something that they've learned about in history class when they were little. Uh, but none of them have ever encountered a male before. Um, oh, and again, this is this is all part of the word world building. It didn't even hit me until around the time of the space pirate attack that, right. hey, you know what? There hasn't been a dude in this novel yet. Um, in fact, when Paige, I'm trying to do this without spoilers, when she's attacked by her 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 version of Jonathan Jans <laughs> after she gets the job. Sure. And then the person that rescues her. Like you don't spend any time describing that person. And I was it was late at night at that point and I'm reading it in that musty tent. And I, I kinda had it in my head that that person was a male. Sure. So then when I get later in the book, I'm like, there hasn't been any guys. I actually flip back to find out if, if that character had been a male or not. Um you never explain why there are no males in the society. It's hinted at there was, you know, something happened and all the males died. Um, I think the novel is stronger for that. Okay. I've seen one person take issue with it on Amazon in a review. Okay. Um, so I guess, I guess my first question is, is, is that backstory something that hit the cutting room floor? Yes. I mean, I mean, do you want to hear it? Should I? Sure. Okay. I mean, um, well, unless you think it's going to spoil it for no, I, okay. I don't think so because, like we said, it's it's just an element that they don't even think about, like the way you and I are speaking English, and we never have to say, you know, the reason we speak English is because we're a former British colony. <laughs> um, so uh, what I what I envisioned among the things when I was doing this was, like I said, uh, it's kind of a office space society where everybody's very officious and bureaucratic, because um, I didn't want it to just be another Captain Kirk and so on and so forth. Um, and 
one of the things that I thought about space travel as I was thinking about it was uh, space travel is very uh, expensive. And in this story, it's dominated by corporations. As you said, there's no, not really any more states. And one of the things that occurred to me was that uh, men have no real value as colonists. Uh, so you could basically pack a, a ship full of women and freeze seamen. And that way, 100% of your colonists are childbearing as opposed to only 50%. Right. So from a profit perspective, it makes sense not to send men into space. And over time, because this is a space-bound society, um, the men were just simply weeded out. Like, they, they had no real use or value in this in this universe. And so it's like we were just talking about, and, and what I was going to go into was uh, when I had this idea, I said to myself, how hard do I need to hit on this? How hard do I need to point out to the reader that there are no males? And so it was like you said, like, I, I just at first, I, I just didn't have any male characters. And it's around the time when, and I really debated about this, but around the time when they meet the hematophages, and there are still male hematophages because they're a wild species. Right. One of the characters says, oh, yes, they still have males. And then in the same way that you or I would say, oh, yeah, the ancient Byzantines wrote in hieroglyphs or cuneiform or whatever. That she'd you be like, might say that. I would never say that. Sure, sure. <laughs> uh, one of the characters was like, oh, males, how quaint kind of thing. Right. And, and I think that was it. And, I, and even that, was that, it. that, even was that I debated whether that had to hit the cutting room floor. But I was like, in this instance, I think they would actually have that conversation. Well, and I think. I think that was the perfect way to do it because, I mean, that's near the end of the book. Yeah. And then I was like, okay, I'm not crazy. There haven't been any guys in this book. Um, Phoebe, that got your attention as a female, as a female reader. You I... were over there playing on your phone. Not that you don't love Steven, no, 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 but no, no, because... as soon as you heard all female cast, you <gasps> animated, like I said, <clears throat> free kitty cats. Oh, yeah. even better. <laughs> no, I just... I thought it was really intriguing, but then your reasoning as to why, that's like really heartless business, but it makes sense. Well, yeah. that's the whole, this whole future is is run by corporations and they are some heartless motherfuckers, uh, including yeah. my favorite character, Diane. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, the, the boss of the show. Yeah, which if this was, if this was office space in space, she'd be the... Mm, yes. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, I like Diane. I, I want a whole spin off novel with Diane. Okay. But uh so now trying to think how to phrase this. All female cast. Um you know, you're a woke dude. Anybody that follows you on on social media knows that. Have you gotten any blowback from the the troll community, you know, the the Vox Day people. Well, I was worried about that. I was kind of worried about it from either side. Um, because on the one hand, like you said, there's the Vox Days. There's the, oh, how come there's no men? What are you saying? Men aren't useful in the future. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> men are not useful in the future, if you think about it. <laughs> um, and I, But I was also kind of worried about uh, whether from I was doing justice. Because it's first person. It's actually first person present. Which is a difficult. So you're worried sort about the female thing. voice. You're you're yeah. worried that on the progressive side, how, how dare you try to write like a female and, right. and represent us? And well, I was worried that maybe they would say that uh, I wasn't doing it justice or that sort of thing. But um, I, I, no, nobody has complained so far. So maybe it just hasn't blown up yet. I think the women felt authentic. Um, and Phoebe, you you have to be my moral center on this. I'm, if I misspeak, if I sound sexist, I don't mean to. Um, I mean, you know, I get incensed when people ask Mary, "What's it like to write a male character?" Or when they, you know, they ask me, uh, "Dead Sea has a gay black man. How did you get inside his head?" Well, you know, he's a human being just like me. Um, but with an all female cast, I know my limits as a writer. I would be worried that all my women would sound the same. Sure. Uh, voice wise, they're all very distinct. Um, yeah. 
Paige, the main character, yeah, sure, I hear your voice in her, especially, as I said, in that opening chapter and that ending chapter. That's that's pure 100% hanging in the backyard drunk Kazanowski. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, so, I mean, what did you do to overcome your fears? Did you have, like, female pre-readers that you sent it to? Hey, you know. Uh, you know, I didn't i was on deadline and i did not actually have any pre-readers look at this but uh i guess just what i did was um i i just looked at the characters um and thought about what might they not say if you know or or what uh yeah i guess that was really it was just kind of getting out of the headspace of uh like a macho bullshit kind of character because there are some macho bullshit characters but they're not men so like their macho-ness comes oh, from yeah, a the different s- the space pirate yeah. i mean my god you know she's jason statham in space right right <laughs> right um so a lot of it was just kind of uh stripping away uh, just and, and it's like you said it's like i have women friends i have a women you know Family, I just think about uh, what do they maybe do different. Uh, a lot of it was kind of like what you said earlier, like stripping away stuff more right. than putting in stuff. So I was kind of like, well, a woman wouldn't really, you know, do this or that or think about how beautiful they're. I, I guess the hardest part was was the romance. Um, uh, I guess I was saying, like, I guess a woman wouldn't really think of her potential romantic partner in these terms she probably think of them in these terms and kind of right. s- flipping it around from like you said my uh backyard drunk talk you know you you mentioned female friends and you know inspiring your characters uh, i may be way off base here but uh the the administrative what's her name kelly yeah based on mary fan right subconsciously maybe uh, a lot of her personality in that character, I okay. thought. Okay, okay. I'm not going to say no. He's blushing. <laughs> he is. But, and, uh, well, I could sit here and do this all day. The the pick, I think this character may have been inspired by this person, but I'm not going to put you on the spot like okay. that. Um, when did you write this? I, okay, uh, I turned this in, uh, February 1st? February 1st. So I wrote it from uh, August of 16 to February of 17. So you were still single when you were writing this? Yes. So your your yes. new girlfriend, I don't know if we can say her name on the air or not. That's fine. She 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 did not inspire any of these characters? Um, Not as a girlfriend. No? You know, okay. But uh, we've been friends for a long time. Have so, you? So, yeah. okay. Well, that was one of my... There's another character in here. Tell me which one. You tell me, Brian. Page. I thought oh. I thought or I mean, like I said, in those opening that opening and closing chapter, it's pure you. Uh-huh. But after I mean, I don't know her as well as I know you, but the few times I've met her and conversed with her, Paige seemed to be a a hybrid of you and her. Am I wrong? Well, who who did who who were you thinking? Uh primarily myself, but yeah, I, I could believe that. Because yeah. like you said, she's been one of my closest female friends for years yeah. before we started dating. Now has she so. read this one? No. Does she read your work at all? She does. Yeah. Uh she read Billy and Brain Eater. Um I think she's stuck right now in Every Kingdom. Uh so maybe when she hears this, uh she'll yeah. finish that up. Yeah. But she did make a big fuss about when I gave when I gave you the copy of the Hematophages. That I had not given her a copy yet, which Uh-oh. we actually then had to oh, go ask dude. Mary. Dude, <laughs> dude. Well, we th- we then had to go ask Mary San uh, whether sh- whether you gave her copies of all your books. No, and whether I don't. she gave copies of all her books to you. I don't give Mary copies of all my books, but I'll tell you why. Okay. Now, much like you guys, Mary and I were friends for many, many years before we ever started dating or anything, became romantically entangled. She used to read my books religiously until we started dating. Mm. Now she can't read them because she sees all the real all shit the that goes. Stuff. Yeah. Okay. No, I don't give her my books anymore because she doesn't fucking finish them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mary, you so, need to yeah. Baby, I love you. I know you're listening, but I ain't lying. Do you read hers? 
Yes, I do. Okay. I was a fan of Mary's work. Oh, yeah, um, obviously. But even before we became really good friends. I was just curious you kept uh, that. I do read reading. hers, but I don't. She puts all of the good stuff from her life in her books. Well, that's not true. I mean, she draws on heartache, too, but I'm okay reading it. Um, I think maybe I have a tendency as a writer to cut a little closer to the artery. Mm-hmm. And I think I would agree with and that. She, and she's yeah. very, she's a very empathic person. I, I think it, she just finds it very hurtful to read sometimes. Um, and I, I, I see you going in that direction too, cousin is Okay. As I said, there's a lot of you in this book. Okay. Um, yeah, you, know, you, I think, you know, I'll be curious to see how, how deeply you cut for the next one. Okay. Um, what do you consider? Do you consider this horror, sci-fi, bizarro genre bender? <laughs> Post horror. Post horror. Yeah. Is this post horror? <laughs> this is. Are there no. any posts in it? <laughs> no. This this wouldn't be post horror. Uh, no, it's definitely horror and sci fi. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if your average uh, Star Wars fan would like it, but yeah. that's why I usually say, do you like aliens? Like you said earlier to to Phoebe. Yeah. But I'm intrigued okay. by this book. Oh, it's it's. I'm phenomenal. intrigued by it's it. It's phenomenal. All right. So when are you you and your girlfriend going to come down and just hang? Why didn't she come today? Uh, she said she didn't want to, uh, like, interfere. She wouldn't be interfering. I'm here. Phoebe's here. <laughs> <laughs> Come down, we can All hang right. together. Um, it leaves itself open for a sequel. hmm Do you have one planned, or is that just how you ended it? I, well, you I probably... mean, it's, it, readers, don't get me wrong. It's a very satisfying conclusion. It's, it's not the the ending to the rising okay there, <laughs> you know, there's an actual end um but sorry, I'm sorry. phoebe just bumped the table I, and, she's, like, and, she's like kung fu fighting down there i don't know what she's doing <laughs> but this she, is not a comfortable chair she's, she's like she can't sit still here, I mean, hang on i'm yeah. gonna trade her chair no no no, no. I'm fine. we're almost done we're almost done well, you think so well you've never listened to after the last time we leave the read the ads that's when the real show starts that's, that's yeah. when i heard start. that yeah. i listened to the end um so you are you, are you thinking about a sequel well I don't want to go on too long about this, but since you brought up sequels, uh, I I almost never write sequels. No. And that's just based on the market. Uh, I guess the way I look at it is because I haven't written my Hunger Games yet, or I mean, maybe this will be it. I don't know. But I just, I don't, I, I want to keep- Space Lampreys. Yeah. The <laughs> Space Lampery Trilogy. <laughs> yeah. The Space Lampery Trilogy. Um, but uh, I'm, I guess I'm kind of waiting until the market demands a sequel because when I'm not seeing the first book take off, I, I could write a sequel for love. Right. But uh, I, I guess I'm still kind of flailing around to find that story that's going to really, you know. This isn't taking off? Uh, it took off since you since you tweeted about yeah, it the April, other day. T- April 2017, this came out. Yeah. So sales have just kind of been eh. Sales were pretty good for a while, then they hit the summer drop-off like they always do, and then, like I said, they rocketed back up when you tweeted about it the other day. Right. Well, hopefully the show will, will keep them up for a while, because I'm yeah. telling you, folks, it's a great book. Ads on the R show, horror show are always a great way to promote your book. Just they do. <laughs> they do. <laughs> All right, so before we let you go, um, let's talk about this friendly rivalry between you and Jonathan Jans. How did that start? I okay. mean, Jonathan Jans, he is the most beloved writer of your generation. He's the sweetest, nicest guy. Even even Craig Spector would would treat Jonathan Jans with nothing but respect and gratitude and kindness. Wrong kind of cancer or right kind of cancer? Oh, my, oh my God. <laughs> um, I ain't been drinking. Okay. <laughs> Not brought to you by bourbon. Well, yes. The truth is that I have only ever met Jonathan once to shake his hand and 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 say nice things to him. You didn't try uh, to stab him, or no, no, no. And yes, I do. Um, I admire him. He's the nicest guy in the world, and he has this beautiful family Look how and all this other stuff. His body language is while he says he's grabbing the <laughs> microphone like he's Sylvester Stallone and over the top getting ready to arm wrestle with it. His <laughs> jaw is set to his shoulders. All right. So, yes. Right. No. See, I'm sorry. You were saying. Yes. I have nothing but love and respect for Jonathan. And uh, what happened was, was it last year? He's blushing year again. Well, you put him on the spot. 
No, you just keep putting him on the stage. This is the horror show. This is like his That's fifth what? appearance. He yeah. should be used to this by yeah. now. Uh, oh, I know what it was. It was around December of last year. So Hunter of the Dead came out last year, and so did uh, Children of the Dark. Children of the Dark. Okay, so Jonathan's big smash hit was Children of the Dark. And my little uh, dark horse kind of was uh, Hunter of the Dead. And around December, everybody starts coming out with their uh, their top 10 and top 20 and top 30 lists. And every time I noticed somebody would you know tweet me or e- sometimes they e- email you, these reviewers, and they would be like, oh, man, you're going to be on my top 10 list. Check it out. Coming up now. And every time I'd like, I'd be like, oh, my God, Hunter of the Dead, number two best book on, you know most sublime things or this or that or the other and every single time number one children of the dark by jonathan jans <laughs> i don't blame him and uh and after this had happened for like the fourth or the fifth time i said to myself you know what uh we're rivals now <laughs> and uh i think i i think i told this to you and do you remember what you said to me i i said he's gonna be your joe hill Yes. Yeah. Well, what you actually said was, oh, so you two are Joe Hill and Brian Keene of your generation. And I said, <laughs> yes, absolutely. But which one am I? And you said, well, you better be the Brian Keene. <laughs> <laughs> For the listening challenge, I love Joe. Yes. He's a dear friend. I, I hate that we have to put these disclaimers in front of every People fucking joke. But, but, yeah, but, yeah, but also but for the listening challenge, like I said, I love Jonathan. Like I said, I don't really know Jonathan, but I admire his work. I admire his family and, and, and everything like that. And I think he admires you, a, too. It's a friendly rivalry. Yes. But yes. yes. But so, uh, you know, will, will you guys put it to the test at Scares the Care next week? Will there be a wrestling match? In the vendor room. Oh, I or... was just going to say we're just going to have to make him out of phases get on the number one at, at the end of well, next We could do year. that, too. Yeah. I did not do a top ten list last year because of my eyesight. I did not get to read as many books. I, I read a lot of books, but I didn't read enough that I thought I had a representative view of what had been published. Sure. But I have to tell you, uh, Hunter of the Dead would have been on my top ten list. Um, it would have been right behind Children, Children of the, the Dark, Dark by Jonathan Thank Jans. <laughs> so. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> Oh, dear. Hey, the complex was right behind the fireman on everyone's list last year. So, so you know my pain, then. <laughs> I know your pain. So, all right. Um, you'll be at Scares the Care. You're going to have books there for sale? Yes. I'm going to be at a table with uh, Stephen Shrewsbury. Yes. And I will have all of my books, including Comatophages. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Dave, what, what, you have thoughts. This is the best combination I could ever think of for two people to be at the table. Shrewsbury and Kazanowski yes. behind the vendor table? Yes. Yeah. And you've never met no. Kaz- uh, no. Shrewsbury, have you? No. Oh, you Why? are in for you are in for a time. You are oh, in for a time. He is he is a big man, uh, big of heart, yeah. big of personality. Big of voice, okay, and and he will get people to your. I was table. gonna say you guys are not gonna be uh, worrying about people coming to your table because yeah. uh, he, he will, will draw them in. He will draw them yeah. in. Just he's, keep them away from gl- from glass tabletops. Yeah, okay. Oh. He, he's got one of the voices seriously that you will hear him outside the vendor room. You know, it's just booming and loud, and he projects and yep, yeah, you'll you'll hear him. So people will be checking you guys out. That's yeah. actually that's actually a really good person to be with in a, yeah. a con. Great. Seriously, yep. That's yeah. why I suggested they split a table. Yeah, no, I I, yeah. I think it's perfect. Yeah, um, you know he because I mean you, I've seen you work cons and you're very good at it, but you let them approach the table. You sure. don't you don't go out of your way to reel them in. Sure, he will reel them in mm-hmm. for you, and okay. then you can just soft sell them. You know. <laughs> So it's going to be a good cup, bad cup? Exactly. That's exactly. Convention. Exactly. Yes, exactly. That makes exactly. You... A Herb Tarlick Les Nessman. <laughs> so it was, that, that reference might be too old for yeah. him. Um, a, uh, oh, God. What's the equivalent, Dave? Jeez, I can't even think of one. I can't think of one either. Head. Yeah. Um, uh, a Peter from Office Space uh, versus uh, uh, Michael Michael Bolton. Okay. Yeah, you'll be the Michael Bolton. He'll be the Peter. Okay. So, all right. Um, Stephen Kosanowski, the Hematophages on sale right now from Sinister Grin in paperback, ebook. Um, 
buy it, folks. I'm telling you, best thing I've read this year. And, uh, you know, un- unless Jonathan Jans comes out with something new, <laughs> uh-huh. could be number one on a lot of people's oh lists uh-huh. come December. All right. Now, I'm really curious now. we got to remember this. Like, end of the year, beginning of next year, so we can go through the top ten list and see where they rank. I, keep I track agree. of it. I agree. Yeah. I, as of right now, it's number one. See, what, mine. what we need to do then is we need to read this, and I assume Jan says something coming out because he always has a new book every year. So we've got to read both of them and then predict which one we think is going to be I on mean, the most all, top ten list. What a, you know, there's a new Happen Leonard, which I haven't gotten to yet. Right. Because um, I want to get Joe to sign it for me next week. Mm. Uh, Kelly Owen has a new one dropping. Yes, she does, and it sounds really good. It does. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of new stuff coming that I'm looking for. The Sisters of Slaughter have yeah, a new they have one coming out. out. Yeah, yeah um, I saw that. that cover. Uh, I can't think of the title or the author, but uh, there's there's a, a book coming out. It's a, it's a nonfiction book about 80s, 70s and 80s horror paperbacks. Okay. You know, like the William W. Right. Johnstones and the Zebras and, yeah. you know, uh, you know, what was it, Del Abyss mm-hmm. with Brian Hodge, Kathy yeah. Koja, you know, uh, Ron Kelly over at Zebra. I, I'm really looking forward to that. But that's like me and maybe Mark who runs a hard drive-in. We're about <laughs> the only two people that are... That I'll are, buy that and read yeah, it. Yeah, you know. That's, that's my kind of thing. But that I I wouldn't compare that to fiction. I always keep that no. separate. But uh, yeah, so I'm... Yeah, I'm very curious now to to see how this competition goes. We'll see how you do, kid. Yeah. Okay. Does Gabino <laughs> ha- does the Gabino Iglesias have anything dropping this year? Uh, not that he's been talking. Yeah, about. I don't. Well, I haven't seen. Right. I, well, like, but I don't, if it does, yeah. it'll probably have too much Spanish in it for the <laughs> audience. Because <laughs> according to Gabino's critics, any Spanish is too much. Too much, even if it yes. takes place in Puerto you know, Rico. I read or, it. I told him. I said. No, I'm I'm coming at this, you know, as a 40, 49 year old white guy living in bumfuck Pennsylvania. Yeah, at first the Spanish was off putting to me because I felt like I don't know what's happening. But if if you put that traditional storytelling narrative flow out of your head, you you've been taught the story flows like this, and you have to read it in this. If you put that out of your head, the the, the novel is actually better for it. I you know. I got very used to it after I think two chapters, and then, and then it didn't fucking bother me at all. You still know what's happening. Yeah, well, yeah, it's the same know. thing I compare it to, like when J.R.R. Tolkien would stop for two pages to have an elvish poem. Yeah, exactly. Like it doesn't stop the book. It exactly, doesn't... exactly. And you know, Gabino did certainly didn't throw Tom Bombadil yeah. in there and bring the book to a crashing fucking <laughs> right. halt. W- what's the name of the book so people can buy it? Uh, uh, Zero, Zero Saints. Saints. Zero Saints. Yeah. Yeah, I raved about that last year. But I figure it's always um, good to remind him because yep. Gabino is awesome. Well, well, here's an exclusive. Actually, it it's. It's not an exclusive. It's hidden on the new JF Gonzalez website, jfgonzalez.org. Um, we've talked about Jesus's unfinished autobiographical novel, um, which he had codenamed El Paso. Right. And we talked about how he had four chapters and an outline finished, but because it's so steeped in the culture of being a Mexican American. Even though he's my best friend, I did not feel I could finish this book. It would be really hard to do that. Um, yes. His wife, Kathy, thought about giving it a stab. And she decided she couldn't finish this book. Um, I am very pleased to announce, uh, the and the, the estate approved this, Gabino Iglesias will be finishing J.F. Gonzalez's book. It, it's called The Crossroads. Okay. Um, That's awesome. So, in fact, that reminds me. I got. I got to send him the manuscript and the, the outline very soon. <laughs> um, that's on my list of things to do. So, all right, yes. one more time. Let's talk about this week's sponsors. First of all, the Forgotten Girl by Rio. Yours, his riveting new thriller. Harvey Anderson is a street performer from New Jersey who enjoys his peaceful life until it's turned upside down when he's abducted and beaten by a group of thugs working for a sinister man known as the Spider. These goons have spent nine years searching for Harvey's girlfriend, Sally. But there's one problem with this. Harvey doesn't remember having a girlfriend named Sally. Until Spider explains that Sally 
has the unique ability to erase a person's memories, an ability she has used to delete herself from Harvey's mind. But emotion runs deeper than memory, and Harvey realizes he still feels something for Sally. And so, with Spider threatening, he goes looking for a girl he loves but can't remember and encounters a danger that reaches beyond anything he could ever imagine. Political corruption and manipulation a serial killer's dark secrets, an appetite for absolute terrible power. For Harvey Anderson, finding the Forgotten Girl comes at quite a cost. The Forgotten Girl is available right now wherever books are sold and also on your ebook reader. This week's show is also brought to you by Sean Seaback's first collection, A Looking in View. Take a look inside a world of the fantastic, strange, and macabre. Lillian witnesses the death of her undead mother. A hitman has one last favor to pay. Frustrated with his mother's boyfriend, 10-year-old Nathan runs away from home in an attempt for a better life. A nursing home has a strange visitor with more to offer than battered paperbacks for the residents. These are just some of the 13 eerie, mysterious tales in a looking-in view. The first collection by Sean Seaback, which features the bonus novella Blue Collar Diesel. A Looking In View is available right now on Amazon in paperback and for Kindle and Kindle Unlimited. Thanks to both of them. And we should mention that the uh, Rio ad oh, that that's right. yeah. is uh, courtesy of our anonymous ad buyer who's right. bought an ad every quarter this year to promote a new book. Right. If you're and, a new listener, yeah, yeah uh, this person does not want their identity named, but they, they bought an ad for every quarter, and they said what they want us to do is is promote a book that we think other people will enjoy. Now, since Stephen, since you were coming in today, I thought, well, it, it would it would be stupid to to use the ad spot for Stephen's book when we're going to have him here to talk right, about yeah, it. Yeah, that so, would be pointless. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So, so plus we want Stephen to give us money. So <laughs> yeah, that's right. We do. Well, he's going to get the sales after this appearance. He's Absolutely. not going to give us money. So. Yeah. Yes. All right. But you just, can, uh, you just can as tell, long as you don't give it to Jans, I'm fine. As long as we don't give it to Jans, <laughs> <laughs> that'll be next quarter now. Huh? Yeah. All right. See, we'll have. We are hoping to interview Jans while we're at Scares the Care. Yes. We'll have to get his side. Definitely. Of this rivalry. We must we must hear about yeah, we have to hear what I, this is the first hear. I'm hearing of this. Does, we'll he, does be, Jans huh? know there's a rivalry? He does now. He does, yeah. <laughs> he listens to the show religiously, so I think there should be some sort of competition between the two at Scares the Cares, and whoever wins gets the ad next quarter. I think that's a great idea. Yes. I don't know what the competition will be though. A we pants some- off. <laughs> what? A, pan- a pants off. It's like a dance off, but it's whoever has the most flamboyant pants. Oh, oh, I've seen some of Chance's pants. That's yeah. a, oh, that's, oh. I don't know. We'll think of something. Oh, that's a, Do you have any a... embarrassing photos of your teenage years? Sure. Okay, because Jan's wife, she posts the- Oh, <laughs> yes. She is the reason Facebook was invented. She yeah. posts these pictures of his player days. Oh, I've seen. Yeah. 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 Do you have pictures like that? Well, they're not like that, because oh, I didn't no. really have player days. Okay. They're going to be more like my Dungeons and Dragons days. Well, even better. Yeah. Even better. <laughs> Okay, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think on this. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. think on this yeah. a little Uh-oh. bit. We have to give them some time there because, you know, Scares is coming up and they have to bring this stuff with them. So. All right. Yeah. See, the interview I want is Jan's wife. <laughs> That's the interview I want to do. Yeah. Uh, she's got stories, I oh, bet. Oh, I She'll bet. be there, won't she? Yeah. She will be there. Oh, well. He's I don't a friendly man. He always brings his I don't family. Know, I don't know how she'd feel about coming on the air with oh, us, though. Oh, okay. yeah. But, she can- she can be- I mean, I love her. She's a sweetheart, but I, I, I think she likes me. I'm pretty sure she likes me, but I don't know how she'd feel about, you know, actually sitting down in front of a microphone. Sure, but oh, maybe that's when you send Phoebe out with her with her recording device. <gasps> no, 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 no. But you're on the right track. That's when I send Phoebe out of the room with Jans. Mm. And then oh, I just and get the have his wife come up and this you is know. like the newlywed game and you yeah. see if your stories match yeah. and you come back in the room. I'm yeah. sorry, I'm sorry I even said that for both of you. <laughs> Holy shit, newlywed game, Jonathan Jans and his wife and Joe and Karen Lansdale. I, we've only got a week to get this together. We probably couldn't pull it off in no, a week's time. We don't have enough time to do it, unfortunately. But that would be great. That would be great. You know what? Let me talk to all involved. I got time. <laughs> Another time, and you know who has to host it, Lombardo. Absolutely, yes, <laughs> of course. And he has to come up with the questions because <laughs> they won't be answering those. Right. See, Phoebe, after we read the ads for the final time, that's when the real show takes place. I see that. Just want to remind people uh, that if you're looking to buy ads, uh, 
really need to start doing it two months two months out. I've already sold an ad, I believe, in November. That's right, two so, months in advance. Yeah, two months in advance. If you if you're looking for a specific date, if not, there's always spots available. But uh, and I'm gonna say <laughs> next week's ad. Might be the most entertaining one we've ever had. Really? Yes. Who is it? Am I allowed uh, to know? I'm not going to tell you ahead Ooh, of time. I want, I want, I want you to see it cold. You've just been a man of secrets this whole episode. Oh, <laughs> I, I, there's an author story, but I can't tell you why. Why ruin everything? We can't take equipment to scare the care, but I can't tell you why. Is this there's, gonna... there's an ad, but I can't. No, is this going to be better than the one man <laughs> show about the Bizarro? Do you remember who was it? John Bowden or somebody did the one man show about Bizarro and he bought oh, an ad space? Right, 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 right. No, this is totally different than that. Okay. Yeah. Somebody said, I have this idea, and I'm like, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. I'll, I would go with it. So is this Gavin Dillinger's ad? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. The, yeah. yeah, I know I know. Oh, I, you already I, know about I know it? what's coming. Okay. Yeah. I, I haven't read it. Yeah. Oh. But it's Gavin. Mm-hmm. Gavin used to write for the outhouse. Right. So yeah, I I know. Okay. By the way, speaking of the outhouse, fuck you, Jude. And I know you're listening. <laughs> Jude Terror, of course, dear friend to us. Um, he used to write for the Outhousers. Now he writes for Bleeding Cool, the premier pop culture website. <laughs> now, of course, you know, DC House of Horror, which we talked about earlier in the show, that got announced this week. Comic blogosphere just blows up. Comic press, everybody's carrying this story. Bleeding Cool's headline, DC hires top horror writers in the field and Brian Keene. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the headline of the year. Oh, that was well played. That was, that was I, I laughed for yeah. 10 minutes. No, Jude is hilarious. So. All right. Well, anything else, guys? Uh, I don't think so. Phoebe, spay and neuter your animals? You of wanna, course. Yeah, you absolutely. Adopt, don't didn't, shop. Didn't you have a complaint for him, by the way? About what? He was supposed to have something for you. I told him. Uh-oh. Okay. Brian told Uh-oh. me that if oh, I came kitten? up, he would bring the kitten, but I didn't want to bother but him. But I didn't know you were coming I know. Today. I didn't want to bother you. So we will schedule kitten play date ahead okay. of time. I, uh, on social media, there's a, you know, I, Whiskers. We're, ta- we're talking we're about whiskers. whiskers, who we talked about two weeks ago. We right. told the story of finding yeah. Whiskers. There's a, a great picture of Whiskers on her war giraffe. Uh, she's adorable. So, she's a sweet so. little. She's a, she's a hellion, though. Well, oh my God, you found so her in the woods. She, she's, I mean, she's tame and she's loving, but she she's also, a- she takes no shit from anyone, especially the dog. Good for her. So, so is she the Furiosa to your There back? you go. Oh, absolutely. <gasps> absolutely she is. There you go. Well, you can call it her another nickname. I'm be- afraid to get her close to Mad Max because Max is a big cat. He's and, got lots of fur though. Yeah, but she like, like Dungeon Master's mother's cat. Uh-huh. Which is an adult cat. Uh-huh. Uh Whiskers will like lurk on the couch when the cat walks by. She'll pounce on her head, wrap all four legs, and just uh-huh. on her ear. And what does the cat do? Shrugs her off like you idiot. Yep. <laughs> uh, you know, and then bats her like a mommy cat would. Well, you have to. I don't know how Max Max might gut her. You know, he 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 does not like being fucked with. Well, then we'll just keep her in the office. Yeah, exactly. So, and all right. If she disappears, she's living at my you house. You come up next Monday or Tuesday to yep. record next week's show, yep. and I, I promise you uh, an appearance by Whiskers. Oh, yay. So, all right. All right. Well, folks, we will see you next week. Right, bye. Bye. Thanks. It was a time when we raced to the TV Guide to see what was playing on Monster Movie Matinee that Saturday afternoon and in some cities that evening. It was all about werewolves, vampires, giant lizards, and those great Japanese monster movies. Relive it all every week as Jim Adams and Mark Maddox bring you Monster Attack. Monster Attack takes a look at those classic monster movies that we all grew up loving. Join us every week on Monster Attack, exclusively on the Project Entertainment Network.